Hi, I'm David Abrams, and I want to welcome you to this edition of the Tenant Experience Network podcast. I want to welcome today's guest, David Poplar, Managing Partner, Solutions Development at JLL, with 4.6 billion square feet in managed properties and facilities under contract. In this episode, we will learn about David's journey to his current position at JLL, where he combines his learning from such roles as Chief Revenue Officer to Vice President of Business Development. We will tap into his thinking around using data to serve clients better as one of his keys to success and get a glimpse into what is top of mind for David as he continues to navigate through new challenges and emerging opportunities. We are excited to be sharing this podcast with you, so make sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode of the Tenant Experience Network. And now I'd like to welcome David to the show. Hey, David, really glad that you could be with us today. Hey, David, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, we both share a mutual passion for workplace. Uh, so I'm looking forward to our conversation. And I thought just to kick us off, maybe you could share a little bit more about your current role as Managing Director and Solutions Development at JLL and how you got there. Sort of walk me through that journey. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> so. I currently lead the solutions development organization for JLL for the west side of the U.S. So that's really helping our customers understand when it comes to um, portfolio optimization for projects and and capital uh, management and integrated facility management and everything that goes within them. Um, I lead the group that puts together the solution uh, to help them operate their, their real estate. And... The way that I got here is a really roundabout route. Um, Most people that I've met in the real estate world uh, have been in it for a long time. Most people in the group that I work in have been at JLL for more than 20 years. But mine is a more roundabout route. I started in technology, um, computer science and engineering, started out as an IT and automation guy. And what I found was, what I really enjoyed was the curiosity in every industry that I was exposed to. So I started off in the pharmaceutical industry. I've worked in strategy consulting. I've worked in social media and I've worked in the retail world um, before getting into the facility management world um, at Corrigo. So I've been in Silicon Valley uh, for for more than a couple decades. Um, I've been CEO of a couple of those companies, chief revenue officer in most places. My passion is helping customers, so that's what kind of drove what drives me into these types of roles. Um, But what what drove me here, the last dot was that I was um, one of the first people at Corrigo, if you've heard of them, they're the uh, work order management, asset management company, and um, Corrigo was bought by JLL, and then um, I had already left Corrigo, I got a call from JLL saying, you know, we're thinking about different ways of um, of filling out leadership roles within our business development group. Would you like to have a conversation about that? Um, And I've just, I've really enjoyed getting into the industry um, and, and, uh, and working with the team here. Well, it is a journey. I started out in financial services, financial accounting, uh, ended up in marketing and communications and, you know, all of a sudden at this stage in my career, I find myself the founder of a tech startup. So yeah. Good for you. Uh, I yeah. love I love startups. That's why we that's why we've been in contact actually. And that's how we connected. Absolutely. Yeah, because um, I love I still love startups, even though I went from big companies and then did startups for twenty years. Back at a big company, I still love startups, and you know, just wish you and the other uh, tech founders well because it's a lot of fun. It certainly is. Um, so, why do you think you're so uniquely suited to this opportunity? Are there any unique skills that have helped you to be successful along the way? Yeah, so while my background might seem disparate, um, the dots really do connect when it comes to um, utilizing technology where, a, where an industry is prime for change and an industry is, is prime to advance forward and leap forward. Um, you know, it's all, it's all about data. Performance is all about data. It's a lot about data at the core and um, gathering, collecting data, analyzing data, getting to business intelligence, and then being able to use that data now going forward for being predictive and being prescriptive. 
So for me, those are the dots that connect together with everything that I've done has had to do with automation and better use of data and analytics. And, you know, it comes back to serving your people, but, you know, it ends up coming back to performing better um, uh, financially, serving your people better. Everything throughout the organization is, is getting the right technologies in place. And what I saw with real estate is that real estate was actually quite a bit behind other industries that have leverage. I mean, think about like banking would be one of the first, right? If they can take a thousandth of a second off of something, they'd spend any amount of money because make transactions a little faster. Real estate has really been, by and large, a, a relationship-based industry for so long that a lot of business was based on that. And so those are the dots that connected. And when I started talking to my company here about, about joining them, that's the story that I told it really, it really matched up to their vision of some huge investments that they're making and some other outside people they're bringing in right. to, um, to augment and complement um, what this, you know, kind of long time real estate company um, was doing. And really, I think you'll agree, it's still early days for real estate. I think that the industry uh, has still um, sort of, you know, fastening their seatbelt and getting ready really to take off. I think there's still a lot of opportunity um, nice. for innovation adoption. Um, uh, you know, prop tech as a term in terms of the, the, the convergence of technology and property uh, is still relatively new. Um, it is amazing how, how much has we've, you know, how much progress there has been over the last couple of years. Um, but these are still early days, so it's pretty exciting. Absolutely. I, I mean, we met through an incubator um, that you had a relationship with, and you know, the prop, the focus in prop tech is is just exploded. I mean, it's ex it's exciting. They have whole cohorts, <clears throat> you know, um, quarter after quarter. They have whole co cohorts of very exciting companies that are coming through. And I totally agree with you. It's it's early days. There's a lot to there's, there's a lot of great stuff that's going to happen in this industry uh, for t with technology. So that path that you followed, which is not necessarily the typical, you know, starting out in real estate right out of college and continuing along that path, but, you know, you've added some, you know, some technology along the way. You've added, you know, some very senior roles in, in terms of being responsible for generating revenue. Uh, any advice for someone wanting to follow a similar path or a path to real estate, but your advice on maybe how they should get there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny to ask me, right? Because um, I've heard some people say that nobody ever, nobody ever sets out to end up in real estate mm -hmm. um, because it's just so, it's so interesting and unique. I would say that if someone has a passion for it, especially if they're younger, people that are early in their career are listening. Um, real estate has amazing opportunities amazing career opportunities that are really broad and really deep. And I'll also say that a challenge that we have in my very large company that has tens of thousands of people is the, is the path to hire our next leaders because we tend to get more mature, you know, people, people end up in the company for a long time, but they don't necessarily jump into the professional side of it right out of college, like many, many other careers. So I would say that, if someone is, you know, uh, young and ambitious and really wants to get into real estate, go ahead and get in, um, but maybe start in parts of the parts of the company functionally that you don't necessarily want to end up in, because the most powerful people in these real estate companies are ones that have been all over the company and all over the world, and then you end up in a job that you really want, and you get the job because of all that other stuff that you did. Right. So. I, I love the path that I took in the background with technology and consulting and all those things. And I use all those things all the time. But if I, if I was interested in getting into real estate and it was 20 years ago, I would probably go to a company that I considered a leader and find people that I liked and respected that were in, you know, culture wise. And then I would just dive in and do anything and everything I could and kind of soak it all up. That's great advice. Uh, so listen, we have no shortage of, of, of challenges that we're all facing. What's the biggest challenge you're currently experiencing and how do you think you'll overcome it? Yeah, it's a really tough one, right? It's um, how, how and when do we get people back to work in a steady state mode, right? I said to a friend recently who 
is a total optimist, but was having a kind of tough day just with lots of things that were difficult about this. And he said, when are we going to get back to the thing, the way things were? When are we going to get back to normal? And I said, you know, I think you're thinking about it wrong. I think you have to realize that we're not going back there. That's the past. Whatever, however things were in January of this year, it's not going to be like that ever again. But it doesn't mean it's going to be worse. It means that we're going to find a vaccine. We're going to find treatment. We're going to get this under control. And a lot of these things, a lot of these decisions that are being made now, they needed to be made anyway. But this is just accelerating them, right? So I think the, the biggest challenge I'm facing now is that it's paradoxical that the decisions that we're making for workplace are as important as they've ever been. Literally, I mean, if you're going to be a little extreme, it's almost life and death in some cases, right? In extreme cases, it's very important. At the same time, us logical people who like to use data and like to take the facts, we don't have a picture of the future. We don't know. We don't know, and you can, you know, um, normally you could do a scenario analysis to help make decisions with your customers. Well, before maybe you had to run five or six scenarios, and now you got to run 30 or 50 because you don't know what the facts are, right? That's hard. That's hard stuff. And, you know, there's ways that we're addressing that and trying to be, you know, trying to be the best advisors that we can. But everybody has to realize that you're, you're making decisions in some dark alleys here. Right. And so you've got to go with good judgment rather than the facts, which is very difficult for fact-based people, right? Very, very difficult for planners. Very difficult for people who you know, normally have a, a vision as to where they want to be in two years, three years, or five years. Yeah. And, and I guess you're right, based on historical uh, information can make certain determinations and and run yeah. those difficult scenarios. And we can, and you have to, and you're going to have to say, we're going to make this decision. And something I say sometimes is we're going to make a decision and we're going to put a stake in the ground and the stake is going to stay there until we move it. <laughs> right. Well, but so you don't, there, okay. every, every day you don't get up and move it, but you keep it there and you head for a target. And then when you realize that you're heading 30 degrees in the wrong direction, because of good news or bad news, and you make adjustments. Right. You know, there, there are those that are, are trying to plan for post-COVID, just like we had pre-COVID and let's mm -hmm. have a post-COVID. But I think those that have said it's not about post-COVID, it's really in a COVID era, you know, yeah. how will things be? And I think that is our reality. Yeah. Um, I think that's taken us, you know, four, five, six months to, to get there, but to realize that we have to think about how will it be, what will it be like for us to live in, in an era with COVID as opposed to, you know, without, because that may not be realistic yeah. at some time. Yeah, and we're, you know, we're going to be fine, right? We're, we're going to be fine. It's not easy right now. It's not going to be easy for some time. But, we, you know, we will overcome this and we will define our, you know, our path forward. Um, but it's a hard problem when you're trying to make decisions that impact people's lives profoundly, like workplace, and you don't have the information to work with. So, um, you know, we just have to be thoughtful in how we make the choices. But you have to make the you have to make choices, you know. Right. Yeah. I know you're very customer focused. Uh, mm. A big part of your your day to day is is helping your customers. Uh, if I gave you an extra hundred thousand dollars of budget right now, how would you spend it, and why? Mm. You no. Know, with money like that, I think I would invest in training and education. Um, we're, we're in a tough spot, um, separate from our pandemic situation. We're, we're, in, um, we're in a tough spot socially as a country right now. Um, and so I think the more education that we have, the more communication that we have about diversity and inclusion um, is just better. More, more is better. Um, JLL is doing a ton of it. It's, we're doing it all the time. And it's just positive reinforcement and it makes, you know, we're all from different places and have different values. That's the way we are, right? We're all unique, but we have to get on the same page around the good, you know, the goodness of diversity. Um, be selfish. It's good for business, right? It makes you perform better. It allows you to solve problems that you might not be able to solve without it. So, yeah, I think with money like that, I would, um, 
maybe embrace more, you know, more education, more training. It can be on customer sites, on our site, um, but really focus on um, inclusion, diversity, and other things that are, you know, still a challenge for our, uh, for our culture. Right. And, and obviously that kind of investment would have a huge, uh, a huge return on investment. So, you know, yeah. hopefully a very positive outcome as a result. I think so. Yeah. Uh, along your journey, along your career path, are there any resources, mentors, colleagues, or books that have helped you, uh, sort of shaped you and, and, and mm. really helped make who you are? These are fun questions, David. Thank you. <laughs> I reflect on them and I'm like, oh boy, I should think about those questions more often. You know? <laughs> well, first, you know, a comment about mentors. I don't have a specific story, but I'll just say that mentors make all the difference. Your network makes all the difference. Your mentors make all the difference. It's all about people and connections. When younger people ask me, what's the key, you know, what's my version of the key to success? I'm like, just you know, working really well with people is, is the secret to every job, <laughs> right? Every, well, at least, you know, most jobs that are around me, um, you need knowledge and education and you need skills. But if you're, you know, if you're not going to be really effective working with people, it's going to be tough. So mentor wise, I would say be aggressive. A mistake that I made early on was that, I don't know, I must've thought it was like cheating or something to, to really lean on mentors and you're not just like buckle down and figure it out for yourself and whatever. But as I'm, as I'm sure a little bit, you know, I, I found people that already knew the answers were, were fantastic. And, um, I really enjoyed doing that for other people now it a lot. In fact, that's why I get involved with the incubators because, um, some people that I advise, they know a lot more than I do about most things, but in terms of like, getting going with a small business, I've got the tire tracks on my back. So just ask me and I can tell you an answer that might save you, you know, 90 days of real hassle, right? 90 days of real trouble. Um, in terms of books, my, you know, I, you can read a hundred different business books and I think they're all fine and usually read chapter two and three of a lot of them. And, you know, you get the idea and, you know, they're, they're useful. Um, I think, you know, my favorite business books are the ones that have lasted forever. Um, you know, that you can always go back to and they're a little bit different every time you read them. So, you know, one is that sounds cliche, but how to make friends and influence people, because it's all about saying, forget about you. It's not about you. When you're in business, you have to think about what your customer wants. You have to think about what your partner wants. You have to think about what other people want. That's how you're going to get something done. Right. So, and, and also when you're a good listener, other people think you're super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So that's one. Yeah, no, I mean, be a great listener. And really, you know, that, that book, you can just listen in 15 minutes. You can listen to the summary. But what it says is put yourself in the other person's shoes and really empathize with them and then try to help them, right? And that's how, you know, and that's how things get done. Another one, if people are interested, is The Art of War. If you've ever, I don't know if you've ever read it, but the art of war, most of it is about, you know, the best way to fight is to not fight, right? It's about finding your way to kind of, you know, the jujitsu of business, right? Working your way around conflicts and, and getting to what you need to get. Um, and it is, it's, it's really cool because that book's been around forever and it's a different book. Every time I pick it up, it's a different book, right? And you just read a couple chapters. The other thing I would say is, you know, my favorite subject in business school was negotiating. and so. It doesn't have to be a specific book, but it was an awakening for me when the professor, his, his name was Max Bazerman, and his book was Negotiating Rationally. Um, but his, the thing that he taught me was um, share a lot of information all the time, right? And when I, I went into that class thinking, you hold your cards really tight, you know what you've got, you don't know what they've got, and you kind of, you negotiate based on looking at the cards. And then you're just splitting up a fixed pie, right? And it's like, here's the pie, and you're going to fight over who gets 51 and who gets 49. But if you share lots of information about what's important to you and what's important to them, you can bring tons of value into the conversation where you can give them something that's worth way more to them than it is to you, and that makes negotiating really easy and it right. creates value. So that was an awakening for me, you know, my favorite, my favorite story from business school. All great insights. Very cool. I know for me, uh, you know, 
my previous you know career where I spent the majority of my time on the marketing communication side, I can say that I didn't really um, learn the value or the importance of creating that network and finding those mentors. And it wasn't really an industry that really encouraged that. And since I've um, switched gears and, and gone down this route of, of tech founder and, and in this whole startup ecosystem, I'll tell you, I, I've had the, 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 the networking, the opportunity to meet people, just as you and I have met, Yes, um, has been extraordinary. And I've probably found more mentors at this stage in my career, just in the last two to three years, than I did in the entire 20 plus years leading up till now. So totally, totally. It's a joy. It's, it's a joy. It really is. And you know, it's meeting, meeting you has been a joy. You know, we're, you know, we're turning into colleagues and friends and um, I look forward to those conversations and we share experiences and it's all because there was an outreach to say, could you provide your insights on something, right? Okay. Um, so just like that influencing people, it's like when you ask somebody to share something they know, it makes them yeah. feel good, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, so speaking of sharing, good segue. Uh, yeah. Can you share any details about something new you're working on uh, that you think our listeners might find interesting? Yeah, it's really the centerpiece of what we're doing with Workplace um, and it ha at JLL, and it has to do with re-entry and reimagining. Um, and um, and by the way, there's lots of things that are publicly available in research that we've done, and you know, there's lots of organizations that are doing it. But um, we're trying to help companies understand what to do, right? What to do now. Um, there's fatigue. Right, everyone started off with really good productivity, um, but there's Zoom fatigue, there's work from home fatigue, you know, there's having kids at home while you're trying to work fatigue <laughs> and all that stuff. And um, it's really hard. People are having experiences that are life altering right now, but this, you still have to work, right? You still have to work, you still have to have a workplace, you still have to build community, right? I think what you're doing, by the way, if I can mention it, like what you're doing is more important now than it's ever been. So your, your timing, you know, your timing was pretty impeccable. Although when I first heard what you're doing, I thought it was great already because there's only a couple things out there that are even trying to do it. You're taking it to the next level, but your timing was impeccable because there are even more dimensions of things that are critical for people's um, emotional well-being and emotional health. So this, you know, community, you know, the build community is, is just super important. Um, but what I would say is that the messages out of the research and, and consulting that we're doing is that um, companies need to be assertive in using this difficult situation to change and advance forward. There are things that they needed to do already, but they were just moving too slowly and they know what those things are. Um, and then there's things that have come up because the workplace is different now, right? It's not exactly about how many square feet you you know how many square feet each person has. Do we want them to have 225 or, or 195 square feet? That's not really what it's about, right? I mean, it's so much deeper. It's so much deeper than that. And so, um, so that's one thing is that um, you know the old Yogi Berra um, quote: "When you get to the fork in the road, take it." Right. And I, I say this to people quite often. I'm like, when you get to the fork in the road, you know, you've got to keep moving. Um, you don't have enough data in front of you to make the decision and you still got to make a decision because doing nothing is worse than those other two choices. Right. Um, the other thing that we found is that the priorities for companies are actually pretty diverse. So every company is not trying to do the same thing. Their number one is all the same. It's wellness and health, right? That's number one. As, as long as they're sane, they're saying, you know, the health and wellness is important. But after that, you've got stuff like, um, you know, is it human experience or is it portfolio optimization? Like some companies have enormous opportunities of portfolio optimization, aren't looking at human experience yet. Is it sustainability? Is it your talent strategy? Um, you know, is it, you know, working from home anytime or working from home, you know? So anyway, all those things, I think I mentioned it before, you have to run scenario, you have to run the scenario planning without actually having good data on some of these things. So you get into dozens of scenarios that you have to kind of think through rather than just a few. And that's what we're working on is in helping to guide companies. We have like 15 key dimensions. I mentioned a couple of them, but we have 15 like key dimensions that are really important to our customers. And 
how do you do that pivot table to figure out what's important so you can decide, you know, are you going to go optimize your portfolio first or are you going to go, you know, have your talent strategy first? You know, you've got to figure those out. So we've got a, we've got a process and a path for doing that. Right. You know, uh, Deloitte in their annual um, real estate outlook back in 2019 leading into 2020 uh, declared that 2020 would be the year of the following mantra, um, location, experience, and data. Right. Um, and I think you just spoke on almost all of those parts. You know, yeah. No longer just about the physicality. Is it 100 square feet or is it 200 square feet? Certainly yeah. the location of your building has to be good, but that's it. Um, so and, and then it is about experience and, and the data that comes out of that to help inform the decisions that need to be made. So yeah. I, I think that's as relevant that's right. you know, now as it was when it was declared at the end of 2019. Um, so you know, maybe they had a, a superpower of being able to see the future. So that's my question for you, actually. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? Yeah, another fun, another fun question. It's like you have a box of cards of uh, fun questions. Um, I, I wish I could see the future. If I had the power to see the future, my favorite thing and, and source of you know joy in business is helping, helping people understand their situation, helping them make decisions. So if I could see the future, maybe I wouldn't tell everybody but I'd be able to help them make better decisions for the path they can head down. Um, you know, it's, um, yeah, if we could, if we could see what the real critical, imp- you know, what, what's the, what's the data for the real critical impacts, um, you know, for this thing, particularly, you know, when, when will we feel comfortable with a vaccine? When will we feel a lot better about a treatment? All of those things are going to change our trajectory dramatically. Right. But, you know, again, from my days of consulting, you know, and project management, I always told people, I'm like, the magic of good project management is seeing the future, right? A great project manager is the project manager that connects dots out in front of them and creates the future, right? So. Uh, well, as our thank you gift for joining the program today, I'll be sure to ship out that uh, crystal ball later on. Uh, <laughs> all, all will be revealed. Um, so you spoke about curiosity when we kicked off the program today. What are you curious about right now? Anything that has you thinking differently in light of current circumstances? Um, well, I hope it's not boring, but you know, this is all about, I'm just, this workplace stuff is just really intriguing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious optimal combination what's the optimal combination of you know places and environment and tools and interactions etc to optimize workplace as we know it and not just now and for the next year in this situation i mean let's call it another year it's going to go on for a while but um but really you know the curiosity is really now a lot of these variables that we took as set in stone are now wet clay right Mm -hmm. and we're allowed to start molding that clay um again going back to what you're doing i think what you're doing is so key you know like it's going to be so key it's about community and about interactions of people you know i've told friends one of my greatest one of my greatest concerns about this pandemic overall is um is mental health issues for our communities you know, into the future because there's so many people that are not great with change. And, you know, we just brought down change like a sledgehammer, right? And like your whole world is turned upside down, right? So I, I think that, you know, prop tech is taking off. Things like you're doing are going to be critical. But the curiosity is with all these different variables that are all moving, you know, we're turning all these knobs at the same time. What's that optimal combination going to be if we could have you know we have the opportunity to change now consider that a positive side of what's happening we have to make changes so maybe do some things we need to before but then going into our new future the new normal right what we had a year ago is not going to exist anymore now going forward what is that optimal you know working circumstance i think that's exciting right and i think to your point it's it's 
how will that impact well-being? Because I think we are only just beginning to see some of the impacts. Um, and I know personally, people in my um, sphere of, of family and friends and colleagues that there there are some that are having some tough times, some challenges. And I'm not Absolutely. just about the economic impact and um, you know really just the the impact of working um, in this way. You know, socialization and isolation. Um, and I don't think we know yet, you know, you know, really no, absolutely. how that will all no. manifest itself. Absolutely. But I, I mean, pay attention. Yeah, no, keep in mind people, a lot of people have a tough time, you know, during normal times. Right. And this is really tough. This is a really tough time. So we have to watch that and we have to use, you know, our abilities and our powers and workplace and technology and stuff to do the best we can to help them in the ways that we can, right. Make them feel more comfortable, more at home. Um, you know, more authentic, all those things. Right. Um, is there anything you wish you had known when you first started out? So I guess that goes back to seeing the future, but anything you wish you had known at the beginning? Um, sure. A couple, a couple of things. Um, one is realize that everybody started without knowing anything, right? We all came into this world not knowing anything. When you get to a new job, you look around and you think everybody knows everything and you don't know anything and it's hard. And just get over that fast because everybody started where you are, right? And so like after you did years and years of being a leader in business and you became an entrepreneur, you were probably thinking, oh my gosh, what did I get? <laughs> right? Every day. <laughs> yeah, every day, you know? So, so that's one is, you know, I encourage, uh, especially like new startup CEOs, like, just remember, like, you're experiencing it just like every other, every other startup CEO or every other, whatever new job that you're taking, that's how it all starts, right? Is that you, and then all you can do is dive in and be curious and soak it up and enjoy it. And the thing that goes along with that, the, set, the corollary with it is, is connect and contact and network and be really good about reaching out to people mm -hmm. and from as many people as you can, because again, I didn't realize this until later than it should have been is that if you just ask people, if you just ask people about something they know, they're generally happy to tell you most of them are. And so, no, I wish I had done a lot more than that. I, I was more like the student that thought you had to study by yourself and kind of figure out that calculus problem by yourself, where I guess you could have gone to that office hours and talked to the professor and that, and she or he would have, <laughs> she would have explained it to you. Right. Right. I feel like in many ways our lives have paralleled each other because I think uh, I wish I had known that much earlier too. Uh, yeah, yeah. And 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 then you know the last one I'll throw in there you know as a bonus is just try hard to balance you know especially for those of us who who are programmed to work hard. Um, you got to take you got to put yourself first. You got to put your 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 body. If your body's not working, then nothing else is going to work. And if your body's not working, the first thing that goes is your brain, right? So don't think that you're going to get great performance out of your brain if you're not taking care of yourself, right? And so that means you got to take breaks and you got to exercise and, you know, find a way to take good care of yourself um, because, um, you know, you, you only get one, you know, you only get one vessel. So you got to treat it really well so you can do all this other fun stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, these have been really a, a lot of insights shared today, a lot of great experience shared. Uh, we both share a passion for workplace. I know that our work is far from done. Um, and I appreciated all of your support and comments about what we're building, but, um, you know, you as well, I wish you continued success. And I know there's still lots to be figured out, but it, it sounds like, you know, you're the right guy to be in, in the shoes that you are and helping your company move forward and helping your clients move forward. Let's definitely keep the lines of communication open, the conversation going, um, and as we work through this period of time, I hope we can reconnect and, and see if there's a part two to this conversation. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, David. Great questions. It was fun. I appreciate it. All the best and we'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. I want to thank David Poplar for joining us on today's podcast and for sharing his journey from early beginnings as a technology expert to now helping JLL's clients run productive global portfolios. Great learning for all our listeners and an opportunity to gain insight into what it takes to become an innovative leader. Please be sure to tune in again for future discussions with leading professionals and industry experts who all have something to say about experience in the built world 
and the impact that technology is having on the largest asset class in the world, commercial real estate. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on a future episode, please reach out to me directly at david at hiloapp.com. And until our next episode, I wish you all continued success in building community where you work or live. Thank you.